Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to start by reminding you to submit questions uh, through the New Economy Forum app uh, so we can practice the wisdom of crowds here, and I'm not the only one who gets to ask questions. Um, I'll be getting your questions right on here, and, I'm, and I'd love to ask them. Um, so let's dive right in. Um, uh, Francis, I was reading you talk about how this pandemic, uh, obviously a global tragedy, has had at least one silver lining, um, which is it has accelerated, uh, as you put it, the world of genomics by several years. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you meant by that and particularly what the, the tangible manifestations are um, for all of us? Yeah, it really feels like in the world of genomics, the last two years have moved us forward, you know, maybe five to ten years in a number of ways. In, in fighting infectious disease, for example, you know, two years ago, there wasn't really the idea of having this global surveillance network to look for early outbreaks. In fact, all we did in genomic epidemiology was, and we did this, you know, a few years ago for Zika, we'd fly into, in that case, maybe Congo, we'd spend a few weeks understanding what was happening and then fly out again. And really, that's changed with the pandemic, where we realized not only do we need an early warning system to identify where outbreaks are happening, but then we need to track an outbreak to see how the virus is mutating, because that has uh, policy implications, that has implications on the tools we're using in the vaccines. And so we're emerging from this pandemic with an understanding that we're now going to have this global genomics pathogen surveillance network. And without the pandemic, that's an idea that we'd have got to, but maybe a decade out. We're also seeing uh, the emergence of genomic-based medicines, right? So if two years ago when we talked about the era of genomic medicine, we'd have talked about N of ones, individual cases where gene-based therapies were used to fight things like sickle cell. But now we've had, in this year alone, 500 people around the world have got mRNA vaccines. And so you've started to see the acceptance that genomic-based medicines are going to play an important part going forward. And it's not just going to be for infectious disease, but we're looking at mRNA therapies now and vaccines for, you know, cancers and other infectious diseases. And so we've accelerated that. We've also accelerated the public awareness of genomics. Like, you know, now people are talking about, you know, variants and mutants and, and, and mRNA. And so on a number of levels, we're seeing that, you know, we're getting out of this pandemic and we're emerging effectively, in my opinion, into this era of biology and the era of the genome. Rachel, how do you think it's going to affect people in everyday lives? Meaning, 10 or 20 years from now, what sorts of things do you think will be treatable in a fundamentally different way than, than they are today? I mean, I, I think the vision, the dream, is that over that time period, patients can look to not only traditional small molecule drugs and antibody drugs, but a third class of medicines, genetic medicines, whether it's mRNA, cell and gene therapies, I think there's tremendous potential to use you know, really targeted approaches to hit at the underlying genetic causes of disease in a way that we really haven't been able to broadly until now. Bill, you have given all that you all do at Roche, to both diagnostically and in terms of treatment. You, you, have, you have a view of this from so many different angles. What's your sense of how diagnosis and treatment will be different in the 2020s and 2030s because of this pandemic? Oh, because of the pandemic. Well, first off, let's acknowledge that if this pandemic had happened even 10 years ago, so many of the technologies that have been vital in both creating diagnostics and in, in treatments, vaccines, I mean, they, they, weren't, they weren't there or they weren't developed and, and on a big scale. Um, so people maybe take for granted how fast the, the life science world reacted, but I, I think if you fast forward that, uh, as David and, and Rachel mentioned, there's, there's many things that go on beyond infectious diseases that you can target. So for example, mRNA vaccines, uh, we've had a, a five-year collaboration with BioNTech on mRNA vaccines for cancer. So the idea is you would have a sample of the tumor, of the patient's tumor, and you look at what are some of the proteins on the surface of the tumor and then in the same way that the spike protein is targeted with the, the COVID vaccine, you basically create a customized vaccine for each patient that has, uh, where, where you're basically generating RNA that produces those proteins from, this, from the tumor so that the patient's own immune system attacks the tumor. Wow. And, uh, and, and this is in the clinic now. Um, it's going to take some tuning because you have to figure out which antigens are the ones that are going to drive the most uh, sort of activity of the immune system. But this is, this is happening. One of the things that it's clear is that we have 
access to a whole bunch of treatments that often arrive too late for people, right? Whether it's colon cancer, whether it's breast cancer, whether it's prostate cancer, all kinds of, that if we had caught it earlier, often we could have turned it into something that was actually quite treatable and quite manageable. Francis, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing around pancreatic cancer and some of these others right now? Because it, to me, when I heard about that, it, it helped me understand really how much of a difference some of these diagnostic tools could make. Yeah, you're absolutely right, David. One of the things that uh, we know in, in things like, uh, in diseases like cancer is if you catch it earlier, you have a better chance of survival. Now, cancer kills 10 million people uh, every year. And, and you know, we know that if you catch a cancer earlier, even for a, a, a deadly cancer like pancreatic cancer, if you catch it at an early stage, you could have a five-year survivability odds of greater than 90%. But if you catch it late, it can drop to less than 10%. The challenge is we don't have a, a screen or a diagnostic for most cancers. And so 71% of the people who die from cancer die from cancers for which there is no screen. And so, you know, the, the, the goal we were shooting for was to see if we could identify cancers early. And so this June, we launched a blood test uh, uh, called the Grail Gallery Test that can identify 50 types of cancer across all stages. Uh, so that came out in June, and, and we're starting to hear, you know, sort of the, the feedback, and, and a couple, couple really stuck with me. One was a story from a clinical oncologist who was talking about the fact that one of her patients did the test, a man in his 50s, healthy, you know, had just done a colonoscopy, it came back clear, uh, but he did the, the test and they found a stage two pancreatic cancer. And she was saying that in her entire career, she's never seen a stage two pancreatic cancer because there are no symptoms until stage four. Now this gentleman was able to get treated, he's healthy, his prognosis is excellent, and that's something she thought she'd never be able to say in her career. Somebody who had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer is now healthy. And so the big opportunity here is catch it early. And, and there's a double win because not only are you saving lives, but it's actually much cheaper to treat a cancer early than it is to treat a cancer late. And so that could be a really big model for us going forward, which is let's catch it as early as possible where it's the most treatable and actually the most inexpensive to treat. Um, I, that, that ticks just a little bit of skepticism in me, but I think you have an answer. It's cheaper to treat it earlier? Oh, much cheaper. Because Even what happens is sometimes in early stage, uh, surgery can be curative, right? If you catch it early, you can cut it out. and so the options you have are much broader if you catch it earlier before it's metastasized and is you know, throughout a person's body. And so you could go from a, a situation where you know, treating a patient at a late stage costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, whereas if you can catch some cancers early stage, it's tens of thousands of dollars. And in one case, it could be, could be curative. In another stage, you're extending life by a few months. What do you see as some of the, the biggest opportunities, Bill, in terms of these early diagnoses changing people's lives? Uh, it's absolutely true what Francis said. Um, you know, if you're diagnosed with cancer and it's already spread to other organs, then chances are you're going to receive therapy until you die. And now, fortunately, we have some pretty good therapies. And so in some cases, metastatic cancer patients can live for three, five, even ten years on, on therapies, uh, but, you know, it's very expensive. If you catch it early, then you have a chance to really eradicate the cancer, either by surgery or a combination of surgery, radiation, therapies. I, I think the opportunities of screening are enormous. Um, the challenge is that with screening, you, you also can have a lot of false positives, yep. and then you can miss tumors. So that, and, and I know, you know, Francis, you're an expert at this. I mean, the, the name of the game in screening is you've got to increase the sensitivity and the specificity. And so I think this is uh, what, what Francis is, is embarked upon now is the beginning of, of something that will be, you know, surely evolving for, who knows, 100 yeah. years. Um, because what you want is basically you can capture everybody's tumor with a simple blood test uh, before it's grown, but not generate false positives. Because false positives means lots of people getting all kinds of workups and medical interventions where there's actually not a tumor yeah. or, or nothing concerning. Uh, but I, there's no doubt this is a very promising field. But in addition, you, you need, in, in addition to finding the tumor, you need to know what to do about it. And maybe it's just surgery, but it could be surgery with some so, sort of uh, customized therapy, uh, a therapy that's targeted to that individual tumor, and especially one that harnesses the immune system so that you have sort of an ongoing surveillance. Rachel, can you talk for a minute about CRISPR, which I know is a big part of your career? 
um, I, maybe it's Walter Isaacson's book, but I feel like a lot of people have a sense of CRISPR, but probably most of us don't quite know as much about CRISPR as we would like to. So can, can you help us understand exactly what it is and how it plays into some of the potential that we've just been talking about here? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so CRISPR is a technology for genome editing. So basically the ability to go inside of living cells and precisely change DNA sequences. Um, in a very simple way, I think of it as sort of Microsoft Word for the genome, but it's not quite as sophisticated as Microsoft Word. Uh, we effectively have a delete key and an insert key. Uh, so fundamentally, we can remove a gene or insert new genetic material at a specific location in the genome of a cell. So this kind of technology has incredibly broad potential. I think most relevant to the conversation we're having right now um, is actually related to what our company Caribou is doing, where we use CRISPR technology to engineer T cells, part of the immune system, to develop cellular therapies that can actually act on very specific kinds of tumors. And so we rely on, on the work that we just heard about, di diagnostics that can tell you not only the kind of tumor, but the molecular signature. What, what are some of the proteins that sit on the surface of that tumor cell? And then we can engineer T cells to find that molecular signature and hopefully kill off those tumor cells. And can you just tell us a little bit about your personal background with CRISPR? Sure. Um, I was the first graduate student in Jennifer Doudna's lab at UC Berkeley to work on CRISPR. Uh, this was back in the dark ages when there were three scientific manuscripts that had been published on the science. It took me about 45 minutes to get up to speed. I'd say it's impossible to read the literature today. There are thousands of papers that have been published. So I feel very lucky to have uh, contributed to some of the field's uh, initial work to really understand these proteins. Um, and now our company is hoping to use them in the development of new therapies. How did you end up working in that lab? Uh, by luck. It was one of the labs that was working on RNA, which I thought was a fascinating molecule. Um, and Jennifer pitched me a project on CRISPR which I'd only ever heard of once before. About a week previously, there was a question on one of the exams I took that asked, what is CRISPR? It was an open textbook exam, and I'm flipping through. There's nothing about CRISPR. I made something up and got it wildly wrong. Uh, <laughs> so when she pitched it the following week, I thought, hmm, sounds pretty cool, and I've been working on it ever since. That's great. Um, Bill, you mentioned the downsides of, of false positives, right? It seems to me there is another downside, kind of a macro downside with screening. And, and it's, it, obviously it's a cost that doesn't outweigh the benefits, but it does seem like something that we should grapple with a little bit. When, when we think about there are a whole bunch of medical technologies that it seems to me do enormous good, but that we also overuse. And that there are real problems with overuse of medical technology because they add to the kind of cost disease of healthcare, which prevents many medical treatments from being accessible throughout the whole world. They've contributed to income stagnation um, in the United States and Europe. And, and I don't want to take us down to a specific debate about one, but I think many people would argue that cardiac stents are a miraculous form of intervention, but that we probably now overuse them, at least in the United States, putting them in large numbers of people. Even if you disagree with that specifically, I assume you all would agree there are examples of things that we overuse. How do we prevent the problem, I think prostate cancer is another example. How do we prevent the problem where because we've screened something and someone sees, wait a second, I, I have this marker or I have this risk, how do we prevent a situation where we always jump to the most intensive, expensive treatment, even if it's not the best treatment? Yeah, honestly, I think in this case of cancer screening, um, it's, if, if we can get the, the appropriate levels of sensitivity and, and uh, selectivity, that, that won't be a big issue because just the, the economics and the health good you can do are so compelling. I mean, just think of it this way. If you're, if you're 30, year old, if you're 30 year, years old and you're diagnosed with a stage two pancreatic cancer, you can have a surgery, remove it, and, and, uh, which is not a particularly complicated procedure, and you can have a normal life. If instead that tumor grows another three years and it's stage four, uh, you're, you're, you're basically, you've got, I don't know, six or 12 months to live during which you're probably gonna get chemo. So I know you're gonna get more expensive therapy and you're gonna die uh, versus a, a, a less expensive therapy and you live. 
And so that, I mean, I think that's pretty compelling. Um, I, I think the bigger issue of waste today in healthcare, well, full stop, I think supposedly about 25% of healthcare is wasted. That's, you know, that's what the experts say. I think it could be higher. I think medicines, a guess, is somewhere between 30 and 70% of patients who are treated with a medicine will not benefit from it. Mm. I mean, if you can use testing and, and better targeted therapies to stop that, I mean, the, the good you can do for human health and for healthcare costs is enormous. So I, I really think uh, it's true that there can be over-testing and over-intervention, but that's not our biggest issue today. Our biggest issue is not good enough testing, not appropriate testing, and not appropriate use or, or appropriate targeting of medicines. And I, I think the, the good that can be done there is enormous. Francis, do you have any thoughts about how we make sure we do appropriate testing rather than the kind that leads to the 30% 30 to 70% of medicines that don't? Yeah, have? I think Bill's hit the nail on the head, which is, look, today the wastage in the healthcare system is primarily around giving people the wrong therapies. And so if we can, so for example, and, and Bill touched on this, in the U.S. today we spend about $30 billion a year on adverse drug reactions. About a third of those could be avoided if you understood the genome drug you know, sort of interaction. And so the work that Rachel's doing, the work that Bill is doing from a therapy perspective, is really around creating targeted therapies to understand what therapies will work for whom. If we play this out 10 years, I think a lot more therapies will be targeted. Today, for example, we know that, and, and the numbers are staggering, but the vast majority of people have mutations that mean that common therapies won't work for them or will generate adverse drug reactions. There are people today taking statins or uh, uh, blood thinners or anticlotting medication that just frankly won't work for them because of their genomic profile. We should all have our pharmacogenomic profile. One of the people I work with knows, for example, that his body would cause him to go into sudden cardiac arrest if a common type of anesthesia was used on him during surgery. So what he does now is when he goes into surgery, he tells his doctor, like, don't use this, you know, use this other thing. The reality is we all should be doing that, and that generates not only a huge amount of waste, but it generates a huge amount of human suffering in the system, too. And blood-based diagnostics especially are great because they're cheap and easy. So, for example, if somebody has, my dad's in his 80s, if he does the blood test and finds a cancer that's still growing, it's super easy for the doctor to say, come back in six months, come back in a year, we'll do another blood test and see if it's really progressing. And so I think the idea of getting more earlier, you know, sort of blood-based diagnostics, this is a great one to even eliminate some of the over-testing that happens. With all of these, I mean, it, one of the byproducts of progress is often inequality at first, right? We see it from the Industrial Revolution, we, we see it from Asia's revolution, economic revolution of the last half century. How do we make sure that we can minimize some of the inequities? And it's a subject that particularly weighs on me right now. I mean, if you go and look at one of the maps that any number of publications is producing on vaccines by country, um, it, it really is an indictment of, of the world's ability to deliver equitable treatments. I mean, I understand why in the first weeks or months it would have been inequitable, right? But at this point, it's still so inequitable. R Rachel, when you, when you think about this, how do you how, how do you think we can make sure that we don't perpetuate and, and even aggravate inequities through these advances? It's it's such an important question, um, and access is key. And so, as as we look at the kinds of cellular therapies that that we're working on, that's actually a huge part of what drives us to take the approach that we are. Um, so today, in the United States and a small number of, of other countries, there are approved therapies where patients can have a cellular medicine that is manufactured from their own T cells. So to treat them, a physician would actually take some of their blood, take it into the laboratory. Two to six weeks later, they would get a vial shipped back to them, and they would receive a product that had been made from their own cells. Um, for some of these patients, it's literally life-saving. It is miraculous what it has done for them. However, it's incredibly expensive. It's very costly. It's very time-consuming. That doesn't scale in a way that you think about traditional drugs being broadly available. Um, as you think about access, it's, it's actually quite limiting, even from a scientific perspective. These are incredibly sick individuals. Many of them simply don't have healthy enough T cells to even start that manufacturing process. Those who do, some cannot live long enough to wait for that product to return to them. And so what we're focused on is using genome editing 
to develop the next generation of these kinds of therapies, where instead of starting with the patient's own T cells, we can go to a healthy donor and use those healthy T cells. And then one manufacturing run results in many doses that can be used for many patients instead of that you know, one patient to one patient manufacturing cost. And so that starts to scale these therapies in a really important and profound way, increasing access and driving down the cost of manufacturing them. Bill, how do you think about access and equity? Yeah, I mean, this is an area that, frankly, I, I think the, the life science industry hadn't contended with uh, very significantly until just recent years. And I think we, we have a long way to go, but there's some, there's some encouraging signs of progress, even in the pandemic. Uh, we, we had an instance, we were testing one of our medicines uh, act, called Actemra, which has subsequently been approved as one of the therapies for treating uh, people with COVID pneumonia. And, uh, but in, our, in the early studies, so we, we, we started doing a pivotal study, and it was in all the kind of the normal places, big academic medical centers, which frankly are underrepresenting minorities and, uh, and, and, and not, uh, but whether it's, uh, underserved populations in the West, but also countries that are underserved. And as we started that pivotal study, we said, you know, this, this isn't real world in a way. We want to see what happens in a lot of the patients who are getting COVID who are from these underserved minorities. And so we set up a separate pivotal study called Impacta that was basically in um, uh, general hospitals in the U.S., in some countries in Africa. And what was very interesting is we found is it was harder to set up the study in those centers because those centers, those hospitals were not as, as used to doing clinical trials. But in the academic medical centers, our study was competing with like 30 other studies for accruing patients. In these underserved hospitals, once we got the study set up, we would get all the patients. And so we were actually able to enroll that study much faster than our original pivotal study, and we got a result that was, that was very important. So I think that was a lesson for us that not only uh, would we be doing good, but we can do well with it. And, and I, I think we're certainly going to do a lot more of that in the future. It, it seems to me in some ways the, the speed with which we have moved during COVID has been miraculous, right? I mean, the, the, the scientific speed of the vaccines has just been amazing. In other ways, it does feel like we need to get more nimble, right? Whether it's this example that Bill just gives, um, w whether it's you know, getting vaccines more widely around the world. Francis, not just about COVID, but generally from a policy perspective, what do you wanna see happen so that the delivery of healthcare and the research of it can become a little bit more nimble than it is today? Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's one of the lessons we learned from the pandemic uh, are the things that need to change. So we talked about the equity point, and I think you know we, uh, certainly in the developed world, need to make sure that we are more globally, more equitably distributing access to this life-saving medicine. It's especially important in targeted therapies and genomics because these are learning technologies. And so, for example, over 70% of the genomes we have today are Caucasian genomes. What that means is, as we're developing therapies, we're developing therapies that are more tuned to Caucasian genomes. And, and unless we distribute this more globally, we're systemically building that bias into our medicine for the future. And so we need to change that. We need more Asian genomes, we need more African genomes. We need to take that challenge on as companies in the space, as, uh, as countries in this space, and make sure we're getting the, the technology out. Um, we also need to absorb that we're all interconnected, and that was a lesson of the pandemic, which is what happens in, in one country impacts all of us. And so, you know, the data sharing that came out, that came to this pandemic has been fantastic to watch. GISAID emerged as a tool that was a free tool by this terrific entrepreneur that became the tool for data sharing that the entire globe depended on. That worked, but we needed more industrial scale in a lot more areas. We need better data sharing. That was essential to get us through, through this pandemic. And so there's an interconnectedness that we need to understand. And, and, and if we can help solve problems earlier, that was another lesson of the pandemic, that the human brain doesn't understand exponential curves. And one of the things about an exponent is if you catch it early, it's much, 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 much better. You can, and we should take on as a commitment this may not be the last, it won't be the last outbreak we see, but it can be the last pandemic we see. But that means we gotta 
catch things very, very early, and that's true of infectious disease, and it's true of cancer. Rich, I want to ask you a question from the audience here, which um, relates to, to something I've thought about. Can you talk a little bit about the, the slowness of a lot of academic research? Um, there's been this fascinating thing that's happened called FAST grants from Tyler Cowen, an economist at George Mason, and Patrick Collison, the CEO of Stripe, where they've tried to fund things more quickly. Um, how much of a problem is it that, that academia um, and NIH often seem to move very slowly? Yeah, it's, it's a super question. I'd, I'd say there are probably many elements along the way that impact the timelines of fundamental basic research. It starts with access to capital, which can take months or years, depending on the funding mechanism that a lab is looking for. Um, I think the next piece is the work itself. Uh, so the work that we do in our organizations, our organizations are trying to win or solve problems. We're able to pull together incredibly large collaborative groups of people inside our four walls, across other organizations, who together can move incredibly fast, incredibly nimbly, and solve problems that none of them independently can. Uh, certainly my experience in academia was quite the opposite, right? You live or die based on your own personal publication record. You're motivated not to collaborate. And so that fundamentally means your own science is often much slower. And that's a feedback loop, right? The reason you need to do your own research and your own publication is that's how you get funding by demonstrating your, your track record. And then there's a final piece, which is the actual data sharing, the data publication. Sometimes the peer review process can take months, sometimes even more than a year. And so it takes a very long time to get a lot of that research out and then be used by the rest of the community. I'm really excited about a lot of what's happened during the pandemic where there's a lot more proactive data sharing. It comes with a special filter though, right? If it's not yet peer reviewed, you have to look at that with an extra grain of salt and understand how to interpret those data and what to do with that information. I wanna to try to get through, we have just a few minutes, a couple quick questions. Bill, why is it so hard to get a rapid COVID test in the United States? Why can't I get Roche's <laughs> test in the United States? Hmm. Um, you know, honestly, I, I think the pandemic has tested the limits of um, the, the regulator, regulatory bodies to approve things because of, of just the, uh, the number of things that have been coming at them. You know, there, there have been literally hundreds and hundreds of companies, some, some of whom didn't even exist two years ago, making tests. And the regulators, you know, they, they only have so many people who are qualified to judge these things. And so I, I think they've done an amazing job of, of doing it and doing it well, but it's not perfect because, you know, again, just think, think of, these are tests that were coming along, you know, I don't know, let's say there were 20 new tests in virology a year, I'm making that number up. But then in the last two years, instead of there being 20 a year, there have been, you know, 50 a month. It's the same people that have to do the job. And frankly, when something has the FDA, the EMA, uh, another major regulator seal of approval, it's expected to be first rate. You, you can't say later, oh, we approved this, but uh, you know, we, we kind of goofed because we were overwhelmed at the time. That doesn't really cut it. Since, since they don't regulate me, maybe I'll be a little blunter and say, it seems to me Europe's done a better job than the US. And that's why it's so much easier to get tests like yours in Europe. Do you disagree? No, I, I don't think you could say that. Okay. I, I think it's just different. The, different regulators have put emphasis in different places. Um, and I, I honestly, in, in testing in particular, I think it's, it's been huge. People expected, uh, there were unrealistic expectations. You know, so for example, let's say the average person was getting one virology test a decade, and then there was this expectation there was gonna be enough for every person to get one test a week, right? You know, you can do the math on yeah. that. That's a, Those like are a, different numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. That's, yeah. A, that's, that's a 500 fold increase in, di in virology tests. It just, it, you just can't do that. Yeah. This is hardware, it's not software, right? I mean, you gotta make the stuff and you, you can't go from one to 500 in two months time. Last two questions. The, this first one from former US ambassador Curtis Chin. Um, to what degree does rethinking medicine require rethinking the present system of patents and intellectual property rights in order to address issues of access and across borders for anyone? Yeah, I think there are uh, 
other bigger issues that are in the way. I think the, the way the patent system works, and it's not perfect, but what it does is it incents lots of investment, which is a good thing. What I think that we need to address are you know, the, the, the will to share life-saving technologies from a national perspective, to say, look, where life-saving technology exists, we need to, to get them out. Um, I also think that there's got to be much more awareness of the inequity of access on a global scale, but even nationally. One of the things we've done is we did a study in the U.S. around access to genomic testing. And even where there is coverage, there are these vast deserts of underserved communities where it's, it's by socioeconomic status. And so I think there's work we need to be doing, and I think that, I think, trumps way more, you know, in, in terms of impact uh, than anything around IP issues that we're having today. There are going to be 20 billion vaccines delivered next year for COVID, okay? 20 billion. That's based on there being uh, free enterprise companies with IP that had the money to invest in plants. If you take away that IP protection and you jeopardize that, we, we won't be ready for the next pandemic. I mean, fundamentally, um, companies like mine don't exist without IP, right? It's critical to us to being able to raise capital to then take on the risk of developing these new kinds of therapies. Last thing, will, will we be able to be tested for COVID at some point without having to have things stuck up our nose? This is an audience question. It's a good one to end on. Will there be a blood test? Will there be anything simpler? Oh, I'm not sure I'd rather have a blood test than something stuck on my nose. But I don't want it in my brain, you know? I'll go, uh, but, but yeah, there's throat swab tests now, and yeah, yeah. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to the audience for the good questions. Thank you.